Welcome, friends. Can you all hear me? Welcome to this afternoon session of the celebration of Bandara of Great Master, Guru Maharaj Baba Savan Singh. I hope you did a good session of meditation after my talk in the morning. <laughs> As you might have noticed, I never carry any notes. But these are some printed. This is the program of the day. My lecture was from 11 to 12. I over spoke for 10, 12 minutes more, 15 minutes more. And then you were supposed to do meditation. <laughs> <laughs> from 12 to 1. You skipped that? <laughs> or did you think I have to meditate? I thought I meditated enough in my life. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm very happy to see you again. And are there any questions? Uh, Jonathan is here. And before I take up a few questions, I like to <coughs> add to what I said in the morning, that we cannot find a perfect living master. Because perfect living masters never say they are masters. They don't have to. They don't come to propagate themselves. They don't come to set up a new religion or something. They don't come to set up anything. They come to take their marked souls back to their true home. They respond to the seeking of the seekers. The seekers, when they're ready, the perfect living master appears in their life by coincidence, by chance, by strange combination of coincidences. They appear in the life of the seeker. Seeker in the beginning may not even know it. May take a few years to find out why a particular person is affecting him, why it's happened, and then later on may find there's a pull coming from soul to soul. And that is why these perfect living masters do not perform public miracles. They perform plenty of private miracles for the seekers. And the seekers every day say, this couldn't have happened except for a miracle. But no public street miracles. That is why these perfectly masters cannot be found by us. But since they respond to seekers, they can find out their marked souls. What is the meaning of marked souls? That means there's lots of seekers all over this globe or, or this planet. And the masters will appear. And that part of the planet where seekers are ready for them. All seekers are not ready. They're seeking, but they're not ready. What makes a seeker ready? A seeker is ready when he or she feels, this is not my place. This is not where I belong. I've had enough of it. I'm tired of it. I want to go home. When these feelings come as part of seeking, the seeker is ready. But if the seeking is merely curiosity, let me find out. People say there is something more. Let me find out. That is seeking of a certain type which does not need the appearance of a perfect living master. Other masters can come. Books can come. Seminars can be attended. And you can get answers to many questions. And that raises more questions. You can spend a lot of time in that. It could be still part of seeking. It hasn't reached the stage when you could say the seeker is ready. When the seeker is ready, perfectly the master appears. And what does he do? He accepts the seeker. By simple process saying, I accept you. Or I will initiate you. There's no difference in the two. People have a very wrong idea that initiation means learning how to meditate. Anybody can teach you how to meditate. It's all in the books. You can read them. It's, in fact, it's so simple, I just explained in the morning. It's a simple exercise to meditate. These perfectly living masters do not come to teach us meditation. The initiation does not mean teaching meditation. Initiation by a perfect living master means he has recognized the readiness of our seeking and has accepted to take us back to our true home. 
period. Therefore, these masters come when we are ready, and if we are not ready, we wait till we are ready. So there are so many seekers, some are ready, some are not. And those who are ready can take advantage, and the masters take them home. It may take time, because even after they accept us and initiate us, which means they accept to take us home, is on their marked, marked souls list. We may still be very interested in the attractions outside. Our mind may still be very strong and still very much attached to things in the world. So it may take time, take a few years, sometime maybe take a few lives, a few lifetimes. If a seeker is ready but is not fully ready, that means the attachments are still very strong in this world we have to take up to two, three, four lives more. Therefore, what will happen? A particular human being has appeared in the life of that person and has accepted him, initiated him, but he has not taken him to his home because he's not fully ready, and the seeker takes another birth as a human being. The master may be dead, he's gone, a new master will come. So therefore, has the initiation been lost that was given by a master? If the master also dies and the seeker also dies in the physical body? No, it's not lost. It's carried over. It's part of the readiness to get more ready. And therefore, in the next life, you'll be more than well prepared. From the beginning, from childhood, you'll have these feelings, not later on. So, we come across people who are from childhood so, so much seeking the same thing. We wonder how it's happened. It's because of a past life initiation. The new master who now appears, a perfect living master, so you are in the list of that person. Were you not in the list of the first master? Yes, you were. But the master carries two types of lists. List A, I'm just classifying, it's not in the books. <laughs> it's just because mind likes classification. List A, you will go back with this particular master in this very life. You will not return to human life again. List B, you will be taken back, but you will have to come for a rebirth and find another master in whose list you will be in A. So B does not mean that you are not going to get a master, it means that you next time or third time, depending upon how strongly we are attached to the pleasures and relationships and so on of this world. So that is why the initiation by a perfect living master is just a contract, I'll take you back home. The teaching of meditation is a means not the end. Our true home from where we came originally is our destination, not meditation. Meditation is a means to find out what these people are saying, is it correct? To satisfy a doubting mind. I am doubting if anything is real, is it really correct? Can I go in and find out? That is why meditation is merely a means to validate that there is something more, and we don't know how much more. We just find out some few, few experiences and we are satisfied, yes, there is something. Very often, perfect living masters help us by giving a glimpse of something internal. And we, we are sure this was internal, this is, there is another world, we belong somewhere else, this is not our world. It's a good glimpse. And we think, now we got a glimpse, we can get it every day, and we don't. Every day we try, and we don't get the same glimpse again. And we go back and say, Master, I had a very good experience once, how come I don't get it again? So that was just a sample to convince your mind that there is something, keep going. It doesn't mean that you have really achieved anything. It's just a validation, the very purpose of meditation, 
to validate there are other things inside you which you don't know about and you can find them out as a human being. So that is why masters give us glimpses sometimes and then that builds a certain faith, a living faith because you've seen something, not a belief system. Here's a big problem that we believe in things, not know things. Knowledge is very different from believing. Religion has done a disservice to us by emphasizing belief rather than knowledge. To know something is different from believing something. You believe something you haven't seen. All religions require us to believe. Have faith, believe. That's totally blind faith. And blind faith has no place in true spiritual practice, in true spiritual journey that we take within ourselves. That is why, in a way, religion, instead of helping us to go within and find the truth, has sometimes been a handicap, a hindrance, because of the pressure on us to believe things, believe things which we don't have any validation. Spiritual path was the beginning of all religions. If you look at the teachings of all the founders of religions, they have not said believe things. They have said go within and find out. All of them have said go within and find out. And religion does not say go within. Religion says support the buildings outside. Support the church, support the temple, support the mosque, support synagogue, support these buildings we are making outside. And come and sit in the buildings. Come on Sundays. Come on Fridays. Do this, do that. All external. Where's the original message gone? To go within and find out. That was spirituality. Now we go into rituals, ceremonies. So that is a sort of a disservice to spiritual seekers. And sometimes this belief system can be so strongly enforced on us by parents, by society, by church, by temples, by these rituals, that we are not willing to accept even our own inner experiences, rather stay with the belief. So that is why believing is not knowing. Get to know what's inside. Get to know yourself. Get to know what the truth is. Get to know the creator inside you. That will be knowledge. So that is why it's very important not to have any blind faith if you want to be on this path. Great Master used to emphasize this point, that blind faith is a statement made by somebody on his or her experience, and you believe it. That's not your experience. It's somebody else's experience you're relying on. Spiritual path requires you have your own experience. No matter how little, no matter how long it takes, it should be your own experience, and rely on your own experience. I am sure that many of you have also tried these things, and what I am saying would be resonating with you because you have come from different religions, different societies, preaching things just to believe. And that is why I am pointing out that the teachings of this great master, which I am sharing with you, I am sharing it purely out of service, seva, to my master. I'm not sharing it because I want to propagate something or want to start something. I'm merely sharing because of my master's permission to share and help people with his teachings. His teachings are very clear that blind faith has no place in spiritual seeking and have your own experiences. That is why I'm sorry, you missed out 45 minutes of meditation in the morning. <laughs> meditation is necessary to keep the mind at bay. The mind won't let us meditate. We have tried hard. Mind will pull us away. People have difficulty. Then we want to fight the mind. And fighting the mind doesn't help at all. We are told, fight the mind. When you fight the mind, what happens? You're sitting for a long time, one-tenth of the time, two and a half hours of meditation, 
and all the time the mind is taking out and he said, no more, come back here, no more. The mind takes us out, we come back, we fight the mind, fight the mind. Two and a half hours, we are totally exhausted. <laughs> Good meditation, <laughs> got nothing. We won every battle with the mind, but the mind won the war. That's what happened. Because the mind was very happy to engage us in battle. The mind, by engaging us in battle, kept us away from the third eye center, kept us away from concentrating our attention. And that is why fighting the mind has not worked. How do we handle the mind then? We handle the mind by ignoring the mind, not fighting. The mind tries to put us away. We say, you do your business, you think what you like, I'm going to be here. That means you split your will into two. There are actually two wills already in us, a mental will and a spiritual will. The mental will is the one that mind is trying to draw us out all the time. Spiritual will is which can say no to the mind. And we have both. Spiritual will is often sub subdued by the power of the mental will. Because we think all the time, the mind is functioning continuously 24-7 and does not allow spiritual will to grow. But we can grow it if we like. We can grow it by saying no to the mind. Not every time. Sometimes when the mind wants something very badly, say you have to go do this, no. Mind says only once, no. You keep up the no, spiritual will grows and mental will becomes weak. It's an experiment, it's a, it's a practice. If you do this practice, if spiritual will becomes strong, it's easy to ignore the mind and its will and stay focused. Mind is thinking, you are ignoring it. It's a practice that you ignore the mind and you stay on. Mind will get subdued when you find the mind. When the mind finds it, it's not listening to you, the mind, it gets subdued. So that is why there are many small, small details in effective meditation. So otherwise we meditate, we just close our eyes and think of other things and just look at the time. I remember, I've told you a story, many of you before. Long ago, I was invited by a friend, I was from India, I was invited by a friend in San Francisco and he said, please come and stay with me for a few days. I accepted his invitation. After a very long journey, from India, I arrived in San Francisco at the airport. He received me, took me home. He said, very good. I'm so happy that you, disciple of great master, are here. We'll have a good meditation session together. I thought I'll sleep for a night, <laughs> but I had to keep up my face. Yes, I am a disciple. I, 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 I meditate, yes. So by the alarm clock, we are up at 3 a.m. He said, that's the only good time to meditate. I said, all right. I was a little sleepy, but I said, I'll keep up my face. So we sat in the lotus position, both of us, and we meditated. Every now and then, I was not meditating, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I was wondering what this guy is doing. So from time to time, I would open the corner of my eye and see what he's doing. I don't know whether it was a coincidence or what. Every time I saw, he was doing like this, <laughs> looking at his watch. Even after 10, 15 minutes, I would see. It is so difficult to meditate for two and a half hours. Every 10 minutes looks like two and a half hours. So, but we, he made sure we were in that position for two and a half hours. And he said, Ishwar, what a beautiful meditation we had together. <laughs> I said, my friend, it was very good meditation, but I must tell you, we meditated on your watch. <laughs> you were meditating on your watch all the time, and I just by chance happened to look, and I also began to meditate on your watch. <laughs> we spent no time on the third eye center. <laughs> but that is the nature of the mind, that we get so much distracted and these distractions don't let us stay on. But if you develop spiritual will and 
spiritual will should be developed in order to overcome the mind and allow the mind to keep on thinking what it wants. If you sometimes practice that you want to don't think of anything, just close your eyes and sit and say, if you want to think of nothing, mind will still think. Imagine what it will think. The most bizarre thing you ever thought will come up. So mind is like that. So therefore, you cannot control the mind like that. There was one Indian saint. He said, if somebody comes to me and tells me that he has lifted the Himalaya mountains in his hand, I know it's impossible. But for one moment, I'll accept it may be such a person has come. If somebody says, I have drunk the water of the, all the oceans, it's impossible. But for a moment, I say, maybe such a person has come. But if somebody comes and tells me he has controlled his mind, I'll say, never, never, never. <laughs> he says, so difficult to control the mind. Mind cannot be controlled. There's no way. Nobody has controlled the mind. I want to meet people who have controlled the mind. What we can do is that the mind is a machine. It's an automatic machine. It's a thinking machine. It thinks all the time. It picks up data stored in our subconscious. It's, store, it's data picked up from DNA molecules from past lives. It keeps on thinking all the time. If it stops thinking, it will die. That is why the mind cannot be controlled in that sense. But we can ignore the mind by developing a spiritual will which comes from the soul, not from the mind. How do we distinguish? How do we distinguish between the spiritual will coming from the soul, and we call it spiritual for that reason, and mental will coming from the mind? The difference is, every day we use the mind and every day we use the soul. Mind performs very limited functions, thinking, reasoning, making sense of things, interpreting sense perceptions, creating new pa patterns, creating new things, period. All done in time and space. Mind cannot do anything that is not done in space and time. Even the smallest thought takes time. What does the soul do? No time. It, it creates experience of love. Instant. Love is not taking time, instant. Intuition, intuitive knowledge, instant. Appreciation of beauty, instant. No time. Soul is functioning. Those are spiritual experiences. Love, intuition, beauty, appreciation, they're all in spiritual experiences we are having all the time. And that's coming from the soul. Those have to be developed if you want to develop spiritual will. Supposing we have to live our life and make decisions, true choices. If you have an intuitive gut feeling, follow that, you are following the spiritual will. If you are thinking about how to do it, you are following mental will. We have these choices all the time. So that is why when we turn our life into living with intuitive gut feelings, I just know, I don't know how, but I just know that kind of feeling, not thoughts. You are already developing the spiritual will. So these two come from two different sources in our consciousness. And that is why when we develop spiritual will, by following intuition more than reason, more than ma mind, you automatically have a very strong spiritual will and the mind can do nothing in that. So these are means of developing something inside us by which we have an upper hand on the mind. But that does not mean that we have controlled the mind, we have ignored the mind. Mind can do its business. It's a machine running. We ignore the machine. It's like a computer. The mind is no different than a computer. You just get the inputs into it, it processes and gives the outputs. It's just uh, performing a normal function. It does not even have any life of its own. The soul gives life to the mind. The soul gives life to the sense perceptions. The soul gives life to the physical body. Life is only soul. The others have no soul and they have no life. Unless there's a soul, there can be no mind alive. There can be no sense perception, no astral self, no physical body can be alive without a soul. That is why the mind should not be taken as a separate entity. It's not a separate entity. It is something given to us as a gift to use. And we should use it like we use a computer. We can't tomorrow say the computer is our boss and we follow what the computer says. 
which may happen by the way <laughs> through ai artificial intelligence is coming up almost creating that condition somebody told me a scientist told me that we are going to develop artificial intelligence which will be so much wiser more intelligent than us we we'll have to just follow its instructions to live our life i say we are already doing it there is no difference we are doing it now also the artificial intelligence of the mind is guiding our lives it's not real our intelligence is spiritual will mind intelligence is mental will that's artificial but we are taking it as real and living the same life that the mind tells us to live so that is why it's important to strengthen your spiritual will and automatically the mind will becomes less it is very essential that the experience of love and devotion should be there if you are truly on a spiritual path if that is not there you are on a mechanical path not a spiritual path the moment the word spirit comes the moment the word soul comes love comes automatically with it therefore if you are doing meditation with no love and devotion it's a mechanical exercise you can keep on all your life and i know friends who been meditating for 40 50 years just mechanically by the clock two and a half hours got nothing naturally it's a mechanical exercise sometimes you may get peace of mind by repeating words you can get peace of mind some people say we have to repeat particular mantras yes you give a power to the mantra with your own suggestion or suggestion of another master or a yogi or a swami it'll help you to calm your mind it'll help you in many ways in this world won't give you any knowledge of the self that is why it's very important that you have love and devotion in your meditation why am i using two words why not love love and devotion go together love is an experience when somebody loves us we automatically respond by devotion we become a devotee the moment you feel real love and when the love is so pure and original not contaminated by conditions not contaminated by judgments the devotion is strong and that is why love and devotion go together the love that perfect living masters show us pull devotion automatically out of us they make us devotees so that is why love and devotion go together love is an experience devotion is a response to that experience so when we are initiated by a perfect living master it is all basis is love and devotion comes automatically even when we are doing meditation to validate these experiences we can still use love and devotion so many people write to me how can you develop love and devotion i said when you love a woman or a man how do you develop love and devotion you don't develop it just grows if you fall in love you it grows so that is why you just think of the beloved think of the beloved all the time it will grow is merely a question of remembering great master once said true meditation is remembering your master If you can remember him all the time your love will grow and that's true meditation other things will come by itself itself but the mind being strong we have to do mental meditation for the sake of the mind to keep it at bay i am happy that you came and heard me on these points there are a few questions i can take up now and i'll take up more tomorrow yes <laughs> If you can have a clear heart with intense desire to see master inside with full faith how long will past karmas hold you from meeting shoved inside you If you have a clear heart with intense desire to see master inside you with full faith how long will past karmas hold you from meeting shoved inside you not even one second if you have in intense desire to meet the master inside that means you are thinking of the master 
Intense desire without thinking of the master has no meaning. If you have intense desire, when you have intense desire to see somebody, the picture of this person, the memory of that person comes up on instantly, immediately. That is why when people want to meet the master inside, they think some particular procedure is required to go and see the master inside. Not at all. Just like you would remember a beloved in this physical world and think of the beloved, the beloved is inside. The same thing with the master. If you have intense desire, remember the master. Remember when you saw the master. Remember if you had a conversation. And when you remember, master is inside. Supposing you do meditation. That means you close your eyes and want to sit at the third eye center. Not outside, but inside. You sit inside and then have intense desire to see master. What will happen? You will automatically remember the master. And master's picture will come. And exactly what the master said earlier will come back in the memory. Then what will happen? If your intense desire is there, the after the memory of what actually you saw with the master, master will still be there speaking to you. That means a continuation of something you saw physically, now you're remembering it and continuing in the head. Some people say, is that not imagination? Of course, it is. But what is imagination? Imagination is entry into the third eye center. Imagination, I told in the morning, is the way to enter there. But once you imagine, you will notice that master will say things you are not imagining at all. Master will depart from your imagination and he's present just because he accepted you. If you are an initiate of a perfect living master, at the time of initiation, the master places himself inside us. And when we imagine or we remember, most importantly, remember, not make up, not make up an image. When you remember the master as you saw him and you remember him with your eyes closed, which you see inside then, then the master begins to say things and do things which are not, not your imagination. But there's a possibility the same thing can be done by the mind. The mind can also produce the image of the master and the mind speaks and we think the master is speaking. That danger is there. So masters are aware of it. When they initiate us and accept us and want that we should be able to talk to the masters inside, they give us a few words as a mantra, as a simran to repeat. And as, as they initiate us or accept us, they empower these words, which makes the mind helpless when those words are being spoken and cannot create an image of the master. The face of the master, the eyes of the master, the forehead cannot be created by the mind if those words are being spoken, given by a master at initiation. This is a safeguard, and especially given for that purpose, so that the mind cannot make up the image of the master. Intense desire, remember the master. Don't make up your own image. Remember the master as you saw, actually saw. Which also brings the point that if you haven't seen the master, you can't really have a image of the master inside. It's just something that you've actually seen in physical eyes, with physical eyes. Initiation has taken place at physical level. And then the master has put himself in you to remember the moment of initiation, to remember the moment you last met the master. When you start from there, the master will appear inside. It won't take any time at all. Dear Ishwar, <clears throat> please explain what you mean by concentrating our attention at the third eye. Do you mean that we should feel we, we are at the third eye? Please explain what you mean by concentrating our attention at the third eye. Do you mean that we should feel we are at the third eye? Yes. Don't look for third eye. You're already there. Right now, in the wakeful state, we are operating from no other place except the third eye. There's no other place for wakeful person to be except at the third eye center behind the eyes. That's where consciousness, consciousness is operating as a notional location of ourself. And that is why we're already there. So when you say concentrate your attention at third eye center, it means don't look outside. Don't think the body is yourself, but think you are inside exactly where you feel you are right now. 
but only you're not in the body, outside in the body, but inside. The best way to do it is, and that's taught to us, the best way to do it is to consider that this body of ours is a house we live in. It's an easy way to imagine that and it be becomes easier for us to work inside. Imagine this body is a house in which we live. The extremities are just attached. The main house is the torso. Six levels, six floors of the house. Each one are different level of the energy centers. We are at the sixth floor. When you close your eyes, you're automatically sixth floor, the other floors are below you. You are already in a house built like a human body and you are at the sixth floor and you are inside there. That's your chamber where you are. And where you are, you feel where you are, is the third eye center. What you do now to concentrate there, to confine all your activities to that space. Draw a chair. Sit, sit on the chair. Not look at the chair. Don't make an image of yourself sitting on a chair. No, you sit on a chair. You are sitting on a chair, but up here. Not on this chair. A chair in here. You can stand up dance, do things, over here. The more you actively engage yourself in the place where you are, but not in the body, but inside the body, you are third eye center. So that is why when I say concentrate your attention third eye center, it does not mean you have to look for a place. You're already there, feel you are there, feel you are doing everything from there, and the rest of the body is just below you. And also make a nice floor, do a lot of work there. Decorate the place. Get the best chair you can. The most expensive. It won't cost you anything. <laughs> also get the best drapes on the side. Decorate your room. And if you stay even a little bit longer, you'll find it expands. It's not a small place. It's a universe inside. It can expand to a whole universe. And as the area expands, you can make it a garden. You can make it, you see the sky. You can do other things. That is why being there, feeling you are there, and concentrating on activities there is concentrating your attention at the third eye center, and that helps you. There was a scientist who named a rock rocket to prove the earth was flat. flat. Is the earth flat? flat? <laughs> there was a scientist who made a rocket to prove the earth was flat. Is the earth flat? How do you feel it is flat? I don't feel it's flat. What I feel if I tell you is worse than being flat. I say it doesn't exist. <laughs> we are just making it up. You can make up in many ways. There's been, scientists are using these words now. Some are saying, it's a two-dimensional flat earth, and the illusion is it's three-dimensional, as some scientists are saying. Some are saying it's a hologram. It is nothing in it at all. Because if you truly examine the information we have today about this planet, about this earth, this universe, what does it consist of? It consists of atoms, which are matter, and space and energy. Energy is not physical universe. Matter is physical universe. Okay, if you examine what is matter, matter is made up of electrons and electrons are made up of certain nucleus, the protons, neutrons, and then there are electrons moving around it. It's very interesting that they're so small. What is between, the, between them? Space. Nothing else but space. How much space? 99.9999999% space. Hardly any matter. The nucleus is very, very small. These atoms. Put all the atoms together, make molecules, make building blocks, and if the whole Earth is taken put together. In 1945, I was studying for my Bachelor of Science degree in physics. Professor said, 
if all the space is taken out. Do you know what will be the size of this planet? It will be like a football. We are very impressed with this knowledge that if space is taken out, it will be like a football. In 1963, I was at Harvard University and a scientist was giving us this exam measurement that if all the space is taken out, this world will be like a pinhead. Are we just space or something more? According to these statements, which are true, we are all space, emptiness. And emptiness is creating all of us, that we can see each other, we can talk to each other, a three-dimensional world is four-dimensional, now they say 11-dimensional world is there, because they can't account for certain radioactive signals that are coming, which means there has to be at least 11 dimensions to prove everything exists in form of energy. So that is why dark matter, dark energy, have to be introduced to introduce a balance between the positive and the negative. This world is constituted by atoms where electrons are floating around the protons. Electrons are negative. There has to be a world where electrons are positive. Because when energy makes matter, it divides instantly into matter and antimatter. Where is the antimatter gone? Where is the antimatter gone? They're searching for it. They can't search, so they call it dark matter. So much imbalance is there, showing there is something missing. We can't see it. We don't know where it is. But we are a hologram. Maybe, that's the scientific statement today, maybe somebody is playing a game on a computer, very good computer, outside of our space and time, and playing a game and creating space and time, and we are all products of his imagination. <laughs> maybe. If you say that is God creating, yeah, that makes sense in religion. God is playing with his computer. I, I, I get lots of uh, cartoons sent to me by people in which God appears. And God is trying to make a mistake. And he says, oh my, he can't say God. <laughs> so, so, things like that. So, who is playing this game? Is, is it a hologram? Is it uh, created uh, uh, from energy? Then the most striking thing that has happened, according to me, in physics, astronomy, was a statement made by Einstein, Albert Einstein, a month before he died. He said, in his notes, he wrote some notes, and he said, I have spent my whole life searching what I have observed. I did not search the observer, the role of the observer. Very important statement. Why did he say that? Because before that, they had discovered that when light photons are passing as a wave, if you try to measure them or observe them, they become particles. That means the human observation or human measurement can convert an energy like a wave into a particle. He, they didn't have too many uh, high, high type of devices at that time. Now they have. Today they have devices where they can actually examine a molecule or an atom. They can examine a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has only one electron. We know exactly the distance of the electron from the neutron. And we also know it's in orbit, keeping the same distance. But is it in orbit like this, or like this, or in any other millions of forms you can take by sight shifting it? Where is it? When I went to college and school to study physics, they used to make a map, hydrogen atom, just put a little dot, a circle, and they place anywhere one electron. They don't do it now. Electron can be anywhere. It's like a wave. How do they find out? You put a laser beam of that size, laser beam anywhere in the orbit, in any orbit, electron is there. That means it is there all over. If you can find it anywhere, once you find it, it's only there, nowhere else. Supposing you put two laser beams, or five, at different points, the electron is at all five places. When you remove the laser beam, it's only at one place which is picked up one, then it's only at one place. 
What is human measurement, human observation doing? Are we creating matter by observation? Very much. This has been proved for 40, 50, 60 years. We have been examining this and more and more evidence has come how human observation, human measurement can convert what is a wave into a particle, what is an energy into a matter. So it's a very big thing. So these new thoughts are coming up about a flat universe. There could be a hologram. Recently, another great scientist died. You probably know Stephen Hawking. He spent his life in trying to study the origin of the universe. And he was very sure of the expanding universe that there was a singularity, a point from where the Big Bang took place and the world is coming into being and expanding all the time. What was the reason for that? What is the calculation they made now? The calculation is when they look at the different galaxies through better telescopes now, all moving away from us. The big mystery came when they said, which is the center of the place from where the Big Bang started? If it is one point from where everything has started, we should be able to find the point. Our planet Earth is in a very remote area of one of the galaxies, Milky Way, very quietly located. But when we look at all the galaxies from here, they're all moving away equally from here. Are we the center of the universe? No way. OK, then we can try measuring from somewhere else. Let's take a telescope to, to outside the space of our universe, measure from there. And that's the center of the universe. Now they found out every place in this universe is the center of the universe. <laughs> that means that the expansion did not take place like we thought. The center itself has expanded and causing the universe. A difficult concept to understand. But they, that's what they say, expanding universe. Also, every year now, for many years, we've been able to see the rate at which it's expanding and the acceleration at which it's expanding. So we know the expansion is taking place at this rate. So let's go back and see the contraction backwards. Yes, we can go back, back. Now we can see at that rate of expansion, reverse reading is about 14 billion years ago it started. That's how we found out. We have no other way to know when the universe started. OK, this universe came into being 14 billion years, 13.6 billion years ago, and has been expanding ever since. We'll keep on expanding till probably something happens. What will happen? Stephen Hawking was the first one to say what could have happened before the Big Bang. Where did it take place? Have we any information? And then they discovered black holes. That fascinated him to study black holes. They found there are some pieces, energy, matter, combination, very small, heavy, so heavy, heavier than our planet, heavier than the, all the universe we are seeing. Where is all that matter sitting in a small little place? And they found that that particular spot, if you see around it, it is eating up everything. All matter is being absorbed by a little spot. Not only all matter is spot, all energy is being pushed in. Not only energy, time and space are being pushed in. So he came up with the idea, maybe we are a product of explosion of a black, black hole. Black hole was already filled up with all of us and all the universe and all the history and time. He wrote a beautiful small little book, A Brief History of Time. You might like to see Stephen Hawking's. And also, a movie was made on that basis. But the point he was making is that something has happened. Maybe it was a black hole. Like we can see now, we've got two black holes now discovered in our own galaxy, Milky Way. And there are a billion black holes now in the entire universe as we are observing. Every day we observe, there are more. Now, that's not the only mystery, by the way. Some of you might be scientists, and I'm just sharing you with, you with you some things, because I shared these things 60 years ago. I was just 30 when I was sharing the very things I'm talking to you today. This will be a problem, a mystery. The mystery is we are finding better telescopes. When you look at the sky and you say, I can see one million miles away, 
you can't see anything million miles away unless the light from there comes to you. Therefore, you are seeing something that existed a million years ago. You can't see what is there now. Because light is the only constant Einstein discovered. Nothing is permanent in this world except light. The speed of light, velocity of light, not light, velocity of light. 184,000 miles per second, whatever the number is. That's the constant number. That's the only constant. Everything else is relative to that constant. He found that the wave of light does not follow the Doppler effect, which means all other waves, sound waves, for example, if it's moving towards you, it gets compressed. It changes. If it's moving away from you, it's different. You can always know when a, a tra truck is leaving, the sound changes. It's going away or it's coming towards you. You can see the difference in the sound. Sound waves get compressed and expanded. Light waves don't. They remain the same, no matter whether they're coming to you or not. Supposing you are driving in a car. I'm sorry I'm taking you into this little scientific <laughs> area. Some of you might be interested. When you're driving a car at 40 miles an hour, another car passes you at 60 miles an hour. You don't feel 60 miles, you feel 20 miles. Because you're also going 40 in the same direction. So the next car that's passing looks like it's just 20 miles speed. If you go faster, you go at 60, both cars are going together. If you go at 80, then you are passing at 20 miles an hour. So the differential between the two will always be the differential in the velocity at which you're going. Now supposing there's a light beam going and a parallel light beam is sent to it, the differential should be zero. But the differential is the velocity of light. How do you explain that? No explanation. The differential between the two is the same number, the velocity of light. Can't explain it. There's no rational explanation, but it's an observed fact. Therefore, light, he said, is the only constant. Everything is relative to that. Everything is relative to this, this particular constant. Now, here we are looking at the speed of light, and we have found there are places where the speed of light is more, around black holes. Just less than a month before Stephen Hawking died, he gave an interview. It's a very good interview. And I, I've listened to the interview. In the interview, the Middle East says, I want to know what was there, where this singularity took place, and time itself came from that point. If the physical time came from there, what was there before that? And this is the great physician saying, I believe there was imaginary time, his words that there is imaginary time before physical time was born. And then he explains, by imaginary time I mean that when I am happy and two hours pass and I feel it's 10 minutes, 10 minutes is imaginary time, two hours is physical time. He says the 10 minutes existed prior to the two hours, even before the world was created. Imagine what he's saying. He's saying what we imagine pre-existed this physical universe. Exactly what I am saying. Exactly what these mystics have been saying. Imagination, not as imaginary as you think, is the birthplace of the physical time. So that is why when you say we have got an astral experience and it's an imaginary, it's unreal because it's imaginary. Why do we say it's unreal? We say unreal because we have fixed our mind. This is the only reality in which we are living now. The physical reality is the only reality. Everything else is imaginary. We just built this into ourselves. Very big mistake. Go into pure imagination. That means where you're not aware of the physical, it will be more real than the physical. Try it out. How is the physical world created from imagination? That is why you can imagine it's flat, it will be flat. You can imagine it's uh, round, it's round that who is creating this world that we are experiencing, the answer from the mystics, answer from the saints is, we are creating this universe. Our consciousness is creating the universe. It's not existing outside of our consciousness. The entire experience we are having of this physical world is coming to us only through our five sense perceptions. You cut the five perceptions out, there's no world. You open up these five perceptions, the world comes into being. 
But we have, because of the nature of reality, definition of reality built into our mind, that we can check the reality of this universe by matching one sense perception with the other. I want to know, is this table real? I'm seeing it. Is it a delusion? I touch it. No, I touch it. It's real. I'm matching one sense perception of touch to make it real for the vision. We are using these five sense perceptions to create our reality. It's amazing that this is the only way we are creating. And they are not coming from outside, they are coming from inside us. When we talk of an astral self, what is the astral self? Astral self is nothing but sense perceptions without the physical body, without matter. That's the astral self. When you become unaware of this physical body by meditation, you become aware of the astral self. How does imagination work in the astral plane? Whatever you imagine becomes real. That's the kind of life there is. You can be young, you can be different, you can change your face just by imagination and become real in the astral plane. Not here. We can't do it. So that is why scientists are trying to understand with all these differences. And now the biggest problem I can tell you, those who are scientists here, that as we develop better telescopes and see further back into history, we have been able to see up to 6.5 billion light years back already. When we reach 13.5, 13.6 billion light years back, we should be able to see the source of this universe and we'll find a bigger universe than we have here. What a big mystery. Every time we have a better telescope that goes further into the past, the world is bigger, not smaller. And that will be totally breaking the current thing, thinking of a singularity that created the universe. There are many universes that are bigger than this, in which this took place. That will also be found out. Anyway, thank you very much for attending to these couple of questions and answers. Uh, I know that I have to give some personal time to people who are waiting. So I'll see you tomorrow again at 11 o'clock. And those who are some of you seeking for initiation, I want to clarify, I don't initiate. I'm not a master. I'm a disciple of this master. But the master is visible for me. Master is present for me. That's what he gave me. And that is why any initiation that I'm doing is actually done by my master, not by me. It's the master power of great master Baba Savan Singh that does it. I am merely a sevadar doing seva for him. He has to approve in his form with me before any initiation can be given. So people write to me, can I get initiated? I say, I can't say. I can't honestly say that. It's only when the time is right for that seeker to come and say, it is a clearance to be given by a great master, if that person is ready or not, and great master's initiation is given. So remember, this is, I am merely a very simple sevadar of master doing this. Like a, like a representative or something. So when you, you can't see him because he's dead physically. Otherwise, he would initiate himself. And if he asks me, I'll do it, but he'll be the person. Same thing is now, but I can see, but you can't see. Therefore, you look upon me as the one who's giving it. But that's just part of the game. It's not the reality. The reality <laughs> is his part. So you can, if you have already asked, there will be time set apart on the Bandara day, and there will be initial screening because there are some conditions he laid down. You have to be vegetarian for a certain time. You have to lead a certain type of life. You have to follow some physical rules. When we are talking of such a high thing, what are these physical rules? The importance of it. Some people have asked me, we are talking of soul and spirituality, and you say vegetarian diet or the physical body? What's the relationship? How does physical need of a diet make a difference to your initiation? We want spirituality. How does it matter what we are eating here? The truth is it does matter. It does matter not because of reality. It matters for us what we believe to be reality. We believe this is reality. We believe this body is real. We believe the concentration of the mind is taking place in the body. 
that the brain is working. We believe that, not masters. So when they say take a vegetarian diet, they say when you are in a physical body and when you think the physical body is real, what you eat affects what you think. And since the whole game of validation through meditation is by concentrating your attention, your power to concentrate is affected by what you are thinking. For example, you read a book and your normal speed of reading is say two minutes a page or one minute a page, say two minutes a page. You go and kill a man and come back and try to read the same book. It will take 10 minutes on the same page. Why? What, what has that to do with your reading a book? It's not the book. It's that the killing of the man affects the mind. Extinguishing of that life affects the mind that the power of concentration is affected and may take a long time to recover back. If you kill a, kill a goat or animal or a sheep, it will take less time. You kill a small insect, it's even less time. You kill a plant, even less time. But there's a recovery time. So therefore, if you want to be meditating effectively, while you think the physical body is your reality, what you eat makes a difference to the power of concentrating attention. And that is why masters recommend that right now you're starting from the belief that this is the only reality, I'm trying to do something in this body, my real body. So that is why in the beginning, it's very important that you follow these instructions. That is why there'll be a little screening that you do follow some basic things which will help you in meditation. And once the screening is done, then I'll see you in Bandara after the Bandara talk in the morning, and we'll see who qualifies and can get in. And don't ask me, am I list A or list B? <laughs> you should find out yourself. And thank you very much for listening.